This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He manages $140 billion in state pension funds. He audits the spending of all state agencies and local governments. He reviews the New York State and New York City budgets. He must approve all state contracts. And he's called recent initiatives of Governor Cuomo, quote, unacceptable and, quote, not the smartest move. The governor of his men called him a defender of the status quo that allows out-of-control spending. He's Thomas DiNapoli, the controller of the state of New York, and he's here to talk New York state and city budgets, state politics and government, and gubernatorial power grabs. Mr. DiNapoli was named controller in February 2007 and was elected to the position in November 2010. Previously, he had served in the New York State Assembly for 20 years, representing the 16th Assembly District in northwestern Nassau County. Welcome back, Mr. Controller. Doug, it's great to be back with it's, you. It's always a pleasure. Now, wait a minute. What's with you and the governor and his folks? Not a lot of kumbaya here. Is it institutional? Is it personal? This conflict. Well, you know, uh, the controller's role is as an independent watchdog in terms of what's going on with the state, particularly with regard to state finances. So, you know, my responsibility is to call it as we see it on uh, on budget, uh, uh, in terms of the numbers, on budget proposals as well. And, and, and you know, I, I think it's important to point out that when we did our analysis of the budget, we led with uh, praise for the governor's budget proposal continuing on a more responsible path that was certainly charted uh, last year. And we expressed some concerns about some of the proposals that uh, I think undercut important principles of uh, transparency and oversight that I think make for good government. And we'll talk about those, but uh, there, there really is an ad hominem element to this. The, the budget director, Magna, you know, accused you of preserving the old Albany way of doing business. This is, is this part of the tactics and strategies to convert this not only from a, an institutional conflict, but to an ad hominem personal conflict? Well, you know, and certainly my, my approach of uh, you know, I've been in elective office for a while, has, has always been to not make it personal. And um, I do find it strange when we make substantive commentary that some of the pushback seems to be of a more personal nature. So I guess the good news there, Doug, is that they don't seem to quib quibble with the merits of what we're saying. And, and, and I certainly don't want to see any escalation in, uh, you know, in, 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 in personal undercutting or personal... I attacks. think they have more than quibbles with the substance. Let's talk a little bit about substance. Some of the major area of disagreement, but really of concern, because these are deeply important state issues. For example, on pension changes. The, the, the suggestion is, or the proposal is, to move to a 401k defined contribution mm -hmm. versus the old defined benefit. And mm -hmm. you, probably more than any other official, has argued strenuously for the maintenance of the defined, defined benefit. benefits yep. Yep. for two reasons. One, moral, and the other is economic. Talk about, talk about your defense of defined benefit pensions. Well, you know, I, I think there needs to be a broad discussion in our nation, not just in New York State mm -hmm. or New York City, about retirement security. And, and a key component of retirement security has been uh, defined benefit pension plans. Now, in the private sector, has been a, a great march away from them. That's left many Americans vulnerable in their later years. In the public sector now, we're seeing some of that same pressure in response to the increased contribution rates that employers are paying, mm -hmm. most of which is driven by the foolishness on Wall Street that resulted in the, in the near collapse of the markets and the great loss of all the pension funds. And I, I do have a concern that we're, we're, you know, we, we did a lot to bail out the banks and the financial system. Uh, we didn't bail out the pension funds. Uh, and now, because the pension funds are being responsible and, and, and you know, getting back to a point of, of, of strong funding, they're being attacked. And, and I really think that, that we, we only look at the cost side. We don't look at the benefit side. When you have people who are secure in their retirement, uh, they have confidence. 
uh, they'll, they'll, they'll spend money, they'll stay in the communities that they, that they help build. In New York State, close to 80% of the retirees from our system continue to stay in New York State. That means about $6.5 billion of our pension benefits stay right here in New York. That's money spent on, on uh, local businesses going shopping, it's money spent on property taxes being paid, it's money spent on generating economic activity. Uh, that's an important part of our, of, our, of our economy. In many parts of our state, it's, it's a key part of it. So, so to risk that and then to put workers in, in a position where uh, they would have uh, participate in defined contribution plans, the, the history is, is very clear. The defined contribution, 401k style plans, mm. were really set up to be a supplement to pensions. Well, to move away from pensions and, and rely solely on a 401k style, well, we see how vulnerable so many New Yorkers are because that's what they have. And if you were about to retire over the past couple of years and your 401k became a 201k because of what happened or with a the or a 101k, K. You, you can't retire. And, and how many stories, Doug, have there been of, of, of seniors, people who were already retired, but all of their savings were in these 401ks, having to go back to work in their 70s and 80s? Okay. There, there are many consequences, none of which I think are very good. Okay. So basically the argument is that defined benefit is superior because it keeps this money in the system and bounces around in economic activity and tax receipts. Then you're making a moral argument that people who have worked and, and sort of deserve the security of that. Now, is there, I mean, I'm the professor, is there data that suggests that this economic benefit argument is correct and the the not efficiency argument is wrong? Well, I mean, sh there are studies, uh, you know, there are entities that, uh, that, that academic uh, institutions that look at, uh, you know, these retirement issues. And, and uh, I, what I've seen pretty consistently is that uh, 401ks are less efficient. It costs more because uh, there, are, there are fees involved, you know, as opposed to uh, the, the way you pool capital and manage it, you know, uh, professionally. Not that there aren't some fees in our right. system as well, right. but when, when, when everybody has individual, you know, fees that they're paying, it costs more. When you as an individual are making investment decisions, uh, you know, the reality is most people don't have uh, access to uh, a great financial uh, counseling. And so no surprise, very often, your results are not as good as professionally managed uh, pools of capital. The, you know, the other challenge is that if you're an individual, you, you, you know, we tend to think we're all going to live to be 90, right? So you have to, you base your asset allocation on, you know, on that notion, whereas when you have a defined benefit plan, again, you're pooling the money. You know, we look at the actual mortality of our members, so we could, we could be smarter in terms of how we do the, in, the, the investment. So there are, there are lots of dynamics, all of which point to, in terms of efficiency and cost, the defined benefit option is a more efficient way to manage. Okay, money. but then, but clearly, there's something amiss with the current pension system, irrespective of defined benefit contribution. And that is, you know, overtime, counting overtime in the last three years into your base benefits. You know, the 20 year and out for, for example, cops and firemen. You know, you walk into the police academy and you're already figuring out when you can retire at 44. So there are, are other elements of the pension system that I think are worthy of reform, irrespective of the, the, the types of uh, benefits, et cetera. And, Certainly with and, the defined kind. And all, all appropriate areas for discussion. You know, I, I, and I, I think, though, that, that labor, those who represent the employees, should be part of that discussion. They should not be excluded from it. We need to keep in mind that uh, just a short time ago, uh, we created a new tier at the state level, Tier 5, which dealt with some of those issues. There's a cap now on the overtime that can be, uh, can be allowed uh, of 15%. Of, of um, you could discuss not, not, not allowing any overtime. You know, that's certainly, I think, within the uh, parameters of what's reasonable. Uh, contributions were, were increased. Uh, the time for vesting was increased. The Tier 6 proposal extends further some of those changes. But that came about because labor was part of the discussion. I think, I think that's, those, are, those are within the parameters of what I think is reasonable to talk about, certainly within the purview of the legislature and the government to determine. What I don't think makes sense is, is to provide uh, that, that defined contribution option because you, you start going down a path, you know, where you know how most people are going to be. They come and say, I'm not going to be here very long. I don't, you know, and it's a one-time uh, decision. Right. And, and people are going to find out 25, 30 years later 
they, they, they made the wrong decision. And that's what concerns me. We should not be so quick to, to move away from a system that I think has provided retirement security for many New Yorkers. And I would like to see a presidential level in this year of presidential election, a national discussion, a national commission to look at, you know, what are the plans that have been doing well? What's the reason for their success? What are the best practices out there? You know, we also need to keep in mind New York has the best funded of the state plans when, when you're talking about public pension plans. There's a reason for that because we, we've managed it in the right way. We should not act as though we are operating from a position of weakness. Last point I want to make on this, Doug, Go ahead. is again, just to inform the discussion. Go ahead. A new tier affects new employees. Right. That means the current costs that we're dealing with today are not going to be reduced by having, an, if you did a new, another new tier today, it would not have an immediate impact. So if we have an issue of, of cost that's burdening local governments particularly, maybe there are other ways in which we could, we could provide some relief. But creating a new tier with an expectation that, that now suddenly the bills are going to go down, you know, governments are not doing uh, significant hiring until you see a large number of people in, in, in the new tier. That, that's when you'd have an impact. So, you know, if the issue is cost right now, a, a new tier is not going to deal with that issue. Okay. And among, okay, so that's one area of public discussion, disagreement, conflict at the state level. Another one is the governor's proposal in his budget that the, the, the executive branch have the ability to move monies around, both within state agencies, across state agencies, and among and across uh, public authorities. And you've, you've and others have objected to this. What's the argument? Well, you know, again, uh, we're, we're all trying to be more efficient, and, and this administration certainly has, I think, done an effective job in moving state government forward in, in that area, and there's more that needs to be done. But uh, my concern is that efficiency need not sacrifice other important principles in, in government, oversight, transparency, accountability. When you work on a budget and the legislature then enacts a budget with certain intent working with the governor on how money should be spent, we should not be so quick to allow without setting some very clear parameters that you, you can just move money around but you know between programs perhaps into programs where there was a, the direct opposite intent of the of the budget that was adopted by those who were elected to do it again it gets back to a basic issue of oversight checks and balances uh, you know that's how representative democracy works we should not be so quick uh, to do that, either in terms of state agencies, if there are reasons as part of streamlining and efficiency you need some flexibility, set the parameters. You know, what are the conditions of, uh, under which you would need to have that kind of authority? And speaking of the word authority, when we're talking about public authorities, they've been the shadow government in New York for so long without accountability to give them more uh, opportunity to All move money off around. Off budget, tens of well, billions of dollars some, off some budget. Of, some of the proposals would be off budget as well. It's moving us away from uh, the agenda that's as important as efficiency, and that's accountability, which comes with openness. It comes with transparency. It comes with oversight. Another area. And it comes with check. It checks and balances. That's how the system's set up. Another area, uh, you know, is in terms of the, our authority in the controls office to do pre-audit of contracts. And there's a specific provision Go ahead. that would that would take away that. Now we can audit after a contract uh, has been let, but why wait? If we could find something wrong with a contract at the front end, and we do sometimes, we can get a better value, or there are issues of what we call vendor responsibility. Why take that away from us? And it's, it's in a, a limited area but st with the Office of General Services, but, but why start to take away that pre-order authority, which our office, Department of Audit Control, has had for a long time? But does the pre-audit power, just in terms of the time it takes to get a contract approved, is it significantly long delay that would impair the ability to deliver the contract, the cost of the contract, et cetera? No, it, 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 you, we, we have up to 90 days, but you know, in, in, in the majority of cases, it's, it's far less than that. And there's been some bogus arguments saying, but it takes you know, all this time. No, it doesn't. Now, sometimes a, there may be a contract that's a problem, and it will take a little longer. But we've put a high priority on fast turnaround. We have encouraged good relationships. I have encouraged between my staff and the, and the various agency heads. If ever we have uh, a, a problem, we try to resolve it very, very quickly. So I think the, the timeliness issue is, is, is less of a concern. You know, what happens sometimes, they take for a long time, sometimes seemingly forever, to negotiate a contract. They come to us and say, we've got to approve it tomorrow. Well, wait a minute. We need, we need some time frame within which to approve So you put, and this again falls into the parameters of uh, institutional prerogatives and checks and balances, if I might. And that's why, in, in our case, 
case, the Comptroller's Office was established as an independently elected office with clear responsibilities under you know, New York State finance law to, to be another set of eyes in terms of looking out for taxpayer interest. Isn't that what everybody should be on the same page about? And sometimes we can find something, and we have many documented instances of it, where we have prevented a bad contract from being let. We've helped to save money. Why take that, uh, that ability uh, to be another uh, watchdog for the taxpayers? Why take it away? A, a sort of another institutional conflict is this access to tax data. Uh, lots of state officials, and I've talked to a couple of them, uh, were really pretty irked at the the, the announcement that folks in, in, in the administration could actually, and other places could look at tax data. Well, that wasn't in our shop. So I, you know, I, I read some of the same reports that, you know, I, I think certainly people have a strong sense that tax information is very personal, very confidential. Uh, you know, again, that was not okay. uh, something I was close to, so I don't want to. And also, I mean, okay, let's move, let's, let's move to another elected official, the other statewide elected official, the, the Attorney General. You and the Attorney General have formed the Joint Task Force, and you've been doing a lot of work together, really a very interactive, mutually beneficial relationship. Talk about what you've done with Attorney General Schneiderman and where you might take this. Well, uh, you know, he, first of all, the Attorney General's doing a great job, and, and I very much appreciate and applaud his efforts on the national scene mm. for the mortgage issue. It's really yep. been, been wonderful, and the president's been listening to him, and it's great. Uh, there, there are clearly are too many instances of, of, uh, of integrity issues out there, corruption in the public sector, how many times we have to read about somebody else getting you know, uh, convicted or something or tried. So you know, in the course of our work, we have auditors, we have, a, we have an investigations unit. And in the past, what we would do is we would work on our end of it. Uh -huh. And if we found something that rose to a level of where it might be criminal uh, with the attorney general's office or with a local DA, do a referral. Sure. The attorney general has obviously a vast uh, 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 you know, network of, of, of investigators and lawyers and so on. Well, what, what the, uh, uh, Eric Schneiderman and I have been talking about early on from, from when he came into office is how can we streamline that process? Again, we'll have to do more with less. How can we have our teams collaborate early when we get, mm -hmm. a, get a tip uh, and, and get on, on the case in a coordinated fashion from the get-go so we can move it along more quickly, not, not double effort and, and save resources? So uh, there's been one situation where uh, our, our collaboration has resulted in some charges. Yep. There, there are some other audits that we have ongoing that we're working on a joint basis with. So we have staff that meet uh, on wait, a regular basis. Wait, 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 stop, yep. stop, stop. You're talking sure. right past it. Um, come on. What? More about these other investigations? Well, uh, what? Go, come on. A the little investigations more. are investigations, so I don't have I don't have breaking news at this moment for okay. you. But but we have a lot that's in the hopper, and you know since we made that announcement, Doug, more calls come in to, sure. to our hotline, yep. hotline, and people are referring more. You know, we're not uh, we're not you know we're not cavalier about it. Right. So it, unless there's something real, okay. it doesn't get pursued. Okay. But um, there's certainly a lot that our staffs are working. Okay, I want to move to the New York City, New York State budgets and sort of the economic situation, but. Real quickly, you control about 140 to 150 billion dollars worth of assets. How are we doing? <laughs> Come on. Well, 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 we're doing we're doing a little better. You know the. Um, uh, how the, are we doing? Good? Are we doing good? Well, first of all, again, as I said earlier, we have the best funds of all the states. Okay. The state Go ahead. So we're in better shape than anybody else. Okay. So we went into the downturn uh, in a stronger condition than others. Uh, at the height, we were, you know, we were at 155 billion. So yep. we haven't made everything back. But keep in mind, we, we've been paying out billions in, in benefits sure. every year. So uh, we value our fund uh, March 31st every year. That's the number that uh, that's key. Uh, you know, thankfully, uh, uh, in more recent weeks, the markets have come back. We have been trying to, um, as part of our asset allocation reduce some of our exposure to the volatility in the public uh, mm -hmm. equity markets. It's, you know, not so an easy or fast uh, change for us to make. But, but you know what, New York is doing pretty well, and we're, we're keeping an eye on what's happening as we head to the end of the month. Okay, let's look at the New York State budget. You released a report on February 7, 2012. Executive budget continues positive fiscal path where you, you know, the praise the activity of the governor particularly and, and the legislature. You could repeat that. Of, you could yes, repeat that. Yes, I understand part. that. I want, I want to make sure that this is a little bit more balanced. <laughs> that I try to set this up as a conflict. I understand this. But, I mean, clearly things changed and things changed for the better yeah. last year. Yeah. I mean, clearly Albany was, the term dysfunction was a euphemism. And then there is now a governor who is 
powerful, savvy, strategic, smart. That may be a problem, but he's all those things, and he got a lot done. And one and of the, the and things the in the budget, re- the legislature responded. That's right. It in, was. In a it was. Way. It had yeah. to be because yeah. they're relatively co-equal branches of government here that we're yeah. dealing with now. But at the same time, you talk about that there are risks remaining despite the progress. You know, the increased taxes, reducing our our out year bu- our budget gaps. Well, talk that's, about that's the on, and that's on the positive side. That's on the positive the, the, side. The biggest risk, you know, really is um, is is the state of our economy. And the sluggishness of the recovery, you know. I, of course, you know the economist said that the uh, recession ended, you know, a while ago. But on the street, no, nobody me. feels no. it. Nobody feels nah. it. Well. So you're still seeing persistently high uh, unemployment. It's, com- it's coming down, but at glacial pace. Uh, you know, you look at the the prime revenue for the state is personal income tax revenue, and you look back to the original projections. We were something like seven hundred million dollars short of what was projected. Better than we were the year before, right. but still, but we still well, have well, shortfalls. And, beca- and the budget is based on those projections. Yep. So when the legislature and the governor came back in, uh, you know, before the holidays and did the change in the in the income tax brackets, right. that really gave, you know, more money to help close out the year. Remember, our fiscal year sure. ends on March thirty first. So we're we're keeping a close watch to make sure that stays on track and gives a little more of a cushion as we head into and next also year. it gives political cover to uh, people who are running for office that they're not involved in budget stuff and well, they can leave and can't. But but still the vulnerability is this: if 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 this recovery stalls ev- even more than it has right. already or starts to go in uh-huh. reverse, you know, one of the indicators. It's not the only indicator. Is certainly what's happening on Wall Street and financial sure. services, a very key part of our state and city economy. And, and, and the third quarter was, a, was not a good quarter for them. Yeah, and, 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 and that's bad not only for the New, New York State budget, and, but certainly for, for the New York, New York City, City as well. Well, thir- through the third quarter, we estimate the profits from, from financial services were, were probably about you know, a little under $10 billion. The city's estimates were that they'd be up to around $20 billion. So we'll see what the fourth quarter numbers when they're finalized. But, but clearly, uh, that's resulting not only in lower profits, but... Uh, job loss. You're seeing firms laying da- laying people off. We we could expect that to continue through 2012. So when high-paying workers are losing their jobs, it has a big impact on income tax revenue for city and the state spending. And and you know we always say in good times. I think we said it on your show in the past. Good times, Wall Street for every job added, yep. they add two in the yep. city. Another outside the city. The reverse is also true. You have a reverse multiplier. So there are vulnerabilities out there. What's going to happen with the federal government? Will some of those federal cuts that might be triggered because of all the yep. shenanigans there? Uh, I don't know that we fully um, in, uh, anticipated that. Uh, what's our contingency if, if, if we have those cutbacks? So there's a lot of vulnerability out there. Uh, and, and the city and the state have been making tough choices for a while, but we're, you know, we're running out of some of those I mean, choices. The headlines today, the EU, Greece, I mean, well, buildings absolutely. are burning. I mean, yeah. that collapses. Well, and it, you know, this is the other challenge, you know, e- even compared to you know, 10, 15 years ago. We are so tied now to a global economy. Yep. You know, so even though the United States is, 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 is moving in the right direction, New York relative to other states is in stronger shape, uh, you know, something blowing up in, in, in Greece or one of the other European nations, the impact that that will have on the global markets, the global economy, we're going to get hurt by it. Take New York City. What's been one of the great um, uh, revenue generators? It's been tourism. It's Absolutely. been hospitality. Yep. And how much of yep. that has been from, uh, from people overseas coming and spending time here, spending money here? So if the euro is, is, is collapsing, yep. uh, that's going to have an impact, and, and, and that's going to impact of what's been a, a key economic driver for New York City. Let's look at New York State real quickly. Uh, the budget that the, the mayor introduced uh, last week, I guess, it's full of one-shots and may never be. Uh, clearly, you cite that there's $5 billion in non-recurring resources. I mean, is this prudent economic policy? Well, you know, I think, I think it's a, we, we identify that as a caution because as you tap into reserves, and you, you run out of options. Well, I mean, the reserves are gone. Yeah. There's no yeah. rollover. So it does get back to that basic question of, of, of what, is the, what is the strength of the economy. You, know, you, look, you look statewide, the city uh, has gained back probably more than half of the jobs that were lost at the peak of the recession. What about the state? The, the state's a, a little less, probably more like 46%, but it's very uneven. So you go to the suburbs, you go to Long Island, where I right. live, 
Long Island's lost jobs. Yeah. You know, uh, it, maybe not a lot, but anything in the negative is certainly not good. Yep. So, so you see very uneven recovery. An area like Rochester, even with all the challenge of Eastman Kodak and what's been happening yep. there, they've gained back uh, about 98% of yeah. the jobs that were lost. So they've figured out, you know, uh, uh, how to retool and, 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 and reinvent. Uh, but it's very uneven across the state. New York City usually is in a stronger condition for lots of reasons. But, but I think the key for the city is the same. What, what is going to happen with our economy? And, you know, the city also very dependent on federal resources. That the federal government, if they're not going to resolve their budget issues and they're going to solve it by cuts that are going to impact on localities like New York City or states like New York, that's going to add another level of risk that, uh, that we're not prepared for. The New York City budget, Greg David in a po uh, blog post on Cranes called the mayor's budget kicking the can, kicking the can down the road in a sense, you know, not dealing with any structural problems and sort of leaving it to the next mayor. That, that's got to be problematic no, but, from but, a but, fiscal point of view. But I do know. think you need to keep in mind the, the mayor and the city council through very difficult times have have effectively uh, weathered these these tough times. Okay, and, I can't get you in. Uh, well, no, but well, no, 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 because because as opposed to the state where where they they were very clearly huge structural imbalances. Right. And 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 after 9/11, when we when we had to tap into reserves, never built them back up sure. again. Sure. The city did the opposite. Oh, absolutely. The city built up. Oh, reserves. absolutely. They had money set aside, yep. you know, the for for the uh, other post-employment benefits. So so the city has been able, and and because of the un uniqueness of the city economy and the resilience of it, they've been able to weather it. So you know, um, I, I, there are risks. We identified those same risks, but um, New York City has shown you know budgetary. And strength. the mayor has demonstrated the, the long-term view. And the new, we still have the financial control board yep. that does, oh, it's, not, yeah. it's not active, but we we, we oh, meet you once could a year. Be. Well, we, if there's a problem. Yep. But, but I don't think there's going to be. No, not on, certainly but, we, under this but in amount. fairness, we do. We you know we do meet on an annual basis. We do get reports. You know we do have an office, as you pointed out in the introduction, that specifically looks at at city finances. Yep. So so uh, you know. Uh, but you're confident. Based on based on past uh, track record the past few years, absolutely. But the longer this this sluggish economy continues, and if there are more steps backward, if Wall Street goes backward again. Mm -hmm. There are tremendous vulnerabilities for New York City and New York State, and we've run out of some of our options okay. in terms of tapping reserves. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so they, they, it's why you need to be very cautious on, particularly on the revenue side. Don't overestimate revenues. Don't be overly optimistic. That's been a big problem in the state for many years, and monitor spending carefully. When you put your budget together, still try to come in under budget with spending. And certainly, if if you're seeing trends going in the wrong way within the budget year. You got to make some other decisions, and the mayor in the past has not been afraid okay. to, to to suggest cutbacks. Okay, so you're coming it. back in a couple of months after the state passes its budget and the city gets its budget done in June, and we're going to see what it looks like. Only if you serve Brajol for us to enjoy. Oh together. God, we're, we're still talking food. Okay, <laughs> stop. My thanks to New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli for being on the show. See you next week when we talk labor with 32 BJ President Mike Fishman here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.